In this video, I'm going to show you how you can make this a lobby system so one player can host the game and another one can join the game. You can start it and they're synced up, so I can draw on this one or draw here or delete and it syncs to both players. So let's go. First, let's make the lobby. This is how the player is going to connect to our game. So I'll make a new user interface, which is just called control when you go to this page. Let's add a panel, so I'm going to do control A, which is the equivalent of pressing this button here, and add a panel. And since this is going to be a multiplayer game, we can just test using two instances on our own screen. So I'm going to make each of the windows smaller. I'm going to go to the project settings, which is control P for me. Go to window, and I'm going to set this to be 600 by 400. So it's a 3 to 2 aspect ratio, but it's fine. So we'll close this. You might not be able to see this on YouTube, but there should be a faint outline here. So just make sure that your panel is inside of that. I'm going to go to move mode and then back to normal select mode. I'm using the W and Q hotkeys. With the panel selected, do control A again. And we want to add a label. This first part, we just want to tell the player that they're going to enter their name for the game here. So we'll say your name. And we can increase the font size. So search font up here. Select font size. We can make it like 20. It's a little bit larger. Back over here, we can move that a little. Now we want the player to be able to type in their name. So with the panel selected again, control A. And this will be a line edit. This is just going to be a quick and dirty mock up here. You can make this a lot fancier if you wanted. Since font is still typed up here, we can change the font size for the line edit as well. That's 20. The player will default be called test underscore user. Again, with the panel selected, let's make a button to host a game. So that's a normal button. Resize that and move it over here. We can just call this host game. Let's go ahead and give some more meaningful names to our nodes in the side here. So this button that we just created, I'm going to name this host underscore button. The line edit, we can say this is player name underscore line edit, and the label can just be player name underscore label, and the panel, we can just call that background. So we have a way to host a game. Let's add a way for the player to join our game. We're going to make something really similar to this format. I'm going to select all of these by selecting the first one, then I hold shift and click the last one, and then to duplicate, it's a control D. I duplicated all of them. I'm going to switch to move mode. Remember the hotkey is W. Move all of that down. Let's edit the text on each one. So in the second copy where it says your name, let's change that to be IP colon. In the second box where we have a test user, this is how the player is going to say who they're trying to connect to. We can change this. When we're testing our game, we don't want to have to build it and send it to someone else. So instead, we'll just make it connect to our own IP. For everybody, your own IP can be reached by going to 127.0.0.1. In the second spot where we have a host game, this is instead going to be join game, and we can rename our buttons. The first one is IP underscore label. The second one, the place where they type their IP address, we can call that IP underscore line edit. And this button here, the join game button, can be called join underscore button. At the bottom, we can also go ahead and add a list of the players that have joined. We'll attach to the background here a list, which is item list. And we'll just leave this at the bottom, and we can call this player underscore list. And the topmost node, let's name this lobby, and we can save this. I'm going to create a new folder called objects, and we can save that. Now with the lobby selected, let's attach a script. We can call it lobby, as the name suggests. And to give myself more screen space, I'm going to install something from the asset lib. It's called script tabs. This is optional for you to install, but if you want your screen to look like mine, you can install it. Install, and then to enable it, go to your project settings. Again, project settings, the plugins tab, enable script tabs. And if we go back to the script tab at the top, we'll see that part's gone. I have the hotkey to minimize that. 
as control backslash. That's the slash that's above the enter key. And you can see instead it has the name of the file at the top here. So it just saves me some horizontal screen space. I'll zoom this in for you guys. Let's also make another script. So I'm going to go to the bottom, my objects folder. I'm going to right click, create new script. This script is going to handle some of the multiplayer and other global related things in our game. I'm going to call it game underscore controller. I'm going to double click that down here. And to make it so that this is actually a global script, go back to the project settings, which I'm just going to use control P, go to the auto load tab, click on this button to open an existing file. Mine was saved in the objects folder, the game controller, click the add button on the side. Note, we're going to refer to this as game controller, the capital G and capital C. Let's set up a few things in this game controller file. First is the player's name on the client side. This is a string value, which by default is not set. It'll be set whenever people join the game. Next is the peer connection. So we'll say var client underscore peer. For now, we'll specify the type, but not actually set a value. So we'll say colon. This is an enet multiplayer peer. And the default port that we're going to use, var, then all caps, default port is equal to 1705. There's a list of a lot of common ports that are used, and this is not on that list. You don't want it to be used by another application already. We also want to track the players that have been connected already. We'll say var connected players. This is going to be a dictionary, so we use curly brackets. We can also go ahead and make a signal here which is whenever the player list has changed. So that's basically someone joined the game. Signal. Let's make a function for when someone presses the host game button. And when they press that button, we want to know what name they used. That's a new player name is what's going to get passed here. That's a string with a capital S. Our this is still inside of the game controller. And we have this client player name. Let's set that value to this new player name. To make that more clear, I'll say self dot client player name is equal to a new player name. The self word is optional. It just helps tell us this is something that was from this file here. Same for the client peer, but we're going to make that a new one. Self dot client peer is equal to enet multiplayer peer dot new. Make sure to put the parentheses there. So if you've ever heard of a peer to peer connection, that's what we're using here. So when someone's hosting the game, they're creating the server for other people to join. Let's create that server when they press the host button. We'll say self.client here, not create server. And the port that we're going to use is the default port that we set above. Now we're going to use the multiplayer keyword. This is on every node. It's all lowercase. If I do control click, we can see the docs here. This is in the normal node. And this is just to handle multiplayer related things. I'm going to go back. So we'll set the multiplayer peer it's equal to that client peer that we just made. We can also go ahead and make the function for when someone joins an existing game. It's going to be very similar to this hosting one. So we're going to copy paste, but just be careful. This one we can say add player to existing game. And we also need to know what IP they're connecting to. So we'll do IP colon string. We'll leave the first two lines the same, but instead of creating a server, we want to create a client to connect to an existing server. We'll say create client, and we're going to use the IP that they provided up here. The rest we can leave the same. Let's go back to the lobby script, so lobby.gd, and go to the 2D view, and let's connect up these buttons into our lobby script. To do that, first let's select the host button, go to the node tab, double click the pressed button, and yes, we want to connect to the lobby script. So I'm going to press connect. That added this function here and connected up this node being clicked on to this function being run. Let's do the same thing for the join game button. I've clicked on join game and it's already in the node tab. I'm going to double click pressed and we want to connect that to lobby. So when they click the host game button, let's use that function that we just wrote inside of a game controller. So it was still in the lobby script, 
And because we made game controller auto load in the settings, you can just say game controller. Remember, it's capital for the GNC here. Dot host game. That's the function that we just wrote. And we want to pass in the player name to use. Remember, they have this text box here, the line edit, where they can type in what name they want to use. That's player name line edit. We can just reference that node here. If we click and drag the node over, you can see it has this dollar sign. It's referencing that node. But we want to get the text value. We'll just say dot text. Now, when they click the join or host button, they shouldn't be able to still click either of those. We should disable them. Let's make a function for that. Funk disable buttons. And inside of there, we can do something similar to how we referenced this node here. So I'll just click on where I have the host button on the side. We can drag. I want to set it to be disabled. So dot disabled equals true. And then we'll do something similar for the join button. Click and drag. And then dot disabled equals true. Now that we have this function written, let's call this inside of our on host button pressed. Now we want to do something similar inside of the join button being pressed. But remember, we have the other function inside of game controller. We're going to use add player to existing game. So game controller dot add player. And this takes an IP and the new player name. The IP that they want to connect to, remember that's from this IP address. So I'm going to click and drag over the IP line edit inside the parentheses. And we want the text property. I'm going to type comma and then go to the next line. And similarly, this time we want the player's name, which we can just copy from right here or just drag over. Either one is fine. And whenever the join button is pressed, we want to disable the buttons like we did before. Now back in the 2D view, let's add one more button. So they posted the game. Somebody joined. Let's let them start the game. Click on the background. Add a new button. Resize. On the side, let's call this start game and rename the button. This is the start button. And in the node tab on the side, double click pressed. Connect that up to the lobby. Now, just for testing, we can add in a dummy scene. So I'm going to add a new node on the side. The shortcut is Control N. I'm just going to make a 2D scene here. We can call this main. And I'm going to attach a sprite 2D. Let's drag the icon.svg onto that. Save the object in the objects folder. Let's go back to the script tab and let's go to the game controller.gd. Let's create a function to start the game. We can call this load main game. Now let's say git underscore tree dot change scene to file. I'm going to drag over from the main file. Let's watch what happens here. If I go back to lobby, when they press the start button, Let's call that function. So game controller dot load main game. Let's double check everything's working up until now. I'm going to go to debug, run multiple instances, run two instances, go back to the lobby. I'm going to run the game. I want to select the current scene as the main one that I'm going to run. You'll see the game starts twice. I can press host over here. And to show some difference, I'll be test user two. I'll join the game and I'll press start on the left. You can see we have the Godot icon here, but not over here. If we go back to the script tab inside of the lobby script, currently we're telling the host, oh, you can show that Godot icon that you made, but the client wasn't told to do that too. To fix that, we go to the game controller tab. It's a super simple change right above where we have load main game. Use the at sign RPC. And inside of here, we can say call local. The way RPC works, you can tell other clients that are connected to run this function. So we know the client also has a load main game function. But back in the lobby, to tell them to use the RPC version, or rather, actually call that to all the clients, take out the two parentheses at the end. And instead, we say a dot RPC. 
If you had given any arguments to load main game, you would provide them at the end here instead. Now let's run this again. For the future, I'm always going to have the host on the left here. I'm going to host the game, join, start the game, and you can see they both have the Godot icon now. Now there's still some improvements that we can make. For one, we can't actually see any movement or anything synchronizing between them. And as you probably read from the title, we're making a drawing app. So now that we have the testing icon done here, we can remove it. I'll just leave it for now. In the main scene, I'm going to attach a tile map. I'm going to add a texture that I already have. You can download it using the link in the description, or any tile map should work here. I'm going to select the res folder. And then I can just click and drag over my tile map. That's how you import. That's it. Now select the tile map. Go to the inspector tab if it's not already selected. If you've watched my channel before, you've probably done this. But we go to tile set, new tile set. Click where it says tile set. Now at the bottom, go to the tile set tab. We can click and drag over this image. Let's say don't do this for us. In my case, each of these tiles is 64 by 64. That's the texture region size. And now to add all of those, I can just click and drag on the side where we have tile size. Change those as well to be 64 by 64. Go to the tile map tab so we can draw in some example. Let's do like some red here. Now let's add a script to the tile map. So I'm going to attach a script. We can leave the name as tile map, sure. We can make this a pretty basic drawing game. So the players are going to be able to left click to place and right click to delete. Let's go to our project settings. Again, that's control P. Go to the input map. I'm going to add place underscore tile and also delete underscore tile. Let's add the actions for those. So to place, I'm going to use the left mouse button. And to delete, let's use right mouse button. Close that. Inside of process, let's track where the global mouse position is. So var global, this is a small bug in the Godot engine. Deselect the tile map over here. Global mouse position equals git global mouse position. Then to track where they actually clicked, you might have seen this before if you watch my channel. You say pause clicked is equal to a vector two. Then we use local to map. This converts a position on the screen to a position in the tile map itself. Let's provide that position. So we'll convert the global mouse position to a local position. For that, we use to local and then global mouse position. Let's check if they're using the delete tile action. If input is action pressed, the reason that we're using is action pressed instead of is action just pressed, is action pressed will let us click and drag to place and delete, whereas just pressed only works on the first click, so we don't ha have to spam click if we by using this way. We'll start with delete tile. Let's type pass for now, and let's make the function that we want to use for deleting tiles. Funk delete tile, and we have to provide the position. There is a default position variable on nodes, so we can provide position underscore just to make it not get confused. To delete a cell, you can say self.set cell. The layer, we only have one layer, it's layer zero. The coordinates that we want to delete are the position that they provided us. For source ID, by providing negative one, it will delete that tile. That's what we want. And we don't have to provide the rest. At the bottom, instead of pass, we can now use our delete tile function. And the position that we want to delete is pause clicked. We can go ahead and test this out. I'll run the game. You can see, as expected, it currently does not sync between the players. This is bad. You never want to get it in this position where the server thinks one thing and the client thinks another. To fix this, at the top here, this is similar to last time. Do you remember how we fixed it then? We have to add the RPC annotation. Since either player can call this, we'll provide any peer. You can reference the documentation here on what all the different options are. The next two options are call local or call remote. I mean, use call local, and we want this to be reliable. Any peer is what you can use when you're transferring input of some kind, which we are, they're clicking. 
Since the server is also a client, that's when we want to use call local and reliable. We never want them to get out of sync. So we want to keep trying over and over until they're synced up. But keep in mind, this is kind of bad for performance, but sometimes there's trade-offs you have to make. There's no one perfect solution for every situation. Similar to when we used RPC before, at the bottom, we have to change this to be an RPC. RPC is something you can call on any function. Remember, any arguments that were originally passed to delete tile, you can just give it to the RPC part instead. Now let's try this. There we go, it's synced up. And I can delete from either end, and it works. That's what we want. And to wrap up, we can make it so that we can place tiles as well. Let's copy paste our delete tile function and call this place underscore tile. This time for the source ID, we want that to be zero. As recall at the bottom in the tile set tab, this is ID zero. If I added another image, that would be ID one and so on. Deselect the tile map. The atlas coordinates, we can just place red every time. If you wanted, you could add some hotkeys to switch. But for right now, we can just use red all the time as of what we're placing. So I can say whatever the atlas coordinates of this position, which in my case, it's 0, 0. But if you wanted green, you can see it's 3, 0. We don't have any alternative tiles, so we can leave that blank. Let's add the action at the bottom. I'll copy our existing if statement. Instead of delete tile, it's a place tile. That's the name of the input that we created. And down here, place tile. Let's try it out. Yep, seems to work. I can left click to place and right click to delete from either side. There's a lot that we could still improve with this project if we wanted, but I think I'll call it there. I hope this helped and thanks for watching.